and welcome to the Podcast Bunch Club podcast. My name is Adela, and I'm the founder of PBC. PBC is like book club, but for podcasts. And every month we curate a thematic podcast playlist and groups worldwide gather to discuss them. The theme for our January playlist was friendship, and it featured five episodes. And you can find the full playlist at podcastbrunchclub.com slash friendship. One of the episodes we featured was from Other Men Need Help. And the episode we listened to was titled, I Miss You, Period, which explores why it's so hard for men to be vulnerable in their platonic relationships. I'm really excited to be joined by Mark Pagan, the host and producer of the show. Welcome, Mark. So happy to have you here today. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. Um, So why don't we start with you telling us a little bit about the show um, for those who haven't yet listened. We've been toying with so many different descriptions this year. We've been doing the mm-hmm. show for three and a half years. We're like, what? And we're like, we want it to not sound dry. We it, so we, we, I, the, there's two simple versions that I'll give you. I'll give you sort of like the internal one and the, the external one. Uh, I'll start with the external one. It's uh, Other Men Need Help is a podcast uh, that playfully looks at male masculine insecurities. Sort of like a minor minor small little description there but uh the internal and this kind of goes to to i think what people should expect when they come to the show um internally we say it's sesame street uh about men for adults mm, so i like it yeah very playful look at uh being a man masculinity maleness and again it's like we trip over describing it but those are the two that i've been yeah. going with lately cool so um Why did you start the show? Like, was there a certain problem you were trying to solve or speak to? I, so a little bit of biography. Um, I've been consuming, you know, I was, I was raised as a boy. I'm a male identified. And I, when I started high school, my father had passed away and there was like a, even before he passed away, there was a bit of a void of, uh, I was always just fascinated with what men did. Like, how I could become a man. And uh, around the time I started high school, my dad passed away. My mom gave me his uh, electric razor and a subscription to Esquire. I was like, I think these, this is what you need. <laughs> like, I think these are the tools. Because <laughs> uh, she, to her credit, like she didn't know what to do with a young boy, you know, with a, 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 mm-hmm. a, a, a guy, a boy that was turning into a man. Um, and so I've, I've just, I've had a love and love hate relationship with media targeting men for a long time. And, and of course we can talk about like movies and, and music, but specifically with like your men's health magazines or your Esquires mm-hmm. or your panel discussions or whatever it is that sort of try to, you know, uh, prescriptively give ideas of what it means to be a man. And I do still consume that material, but I just, I got to a point, especially as an adult was like, I am a self-labeled, progressive, open, educated, yada, yada, yada man. And I'm still like, I see I'm getting away with murder, you know, with like the things that are allotted to me just because of my gender. Uh, And I just wanted, I really, really, really just wanted uh, more accountability, honesty, uh, and playfulness in media in which men were speaking and speaking about um, speaking about being a man. And so that could, you know, anywhere from like a news anchor to be like, I screwed over my colleague because I'm feeling really like old and they're super young. And like, I'm sorry, I botched that. Like I, I did that because I'm feeling insecure. Like if more, I just wanted more of that to happen. Uh, and so initially this, the, the, going back to the Sesame Street about men idea, it was supposed to be a television show, uh, a oh. web series and a television show. That was the initial idea. And I, both because of myself impatiently being an impatient creative, as well as sort mm-hmm. of like the way I was playing with the format, I was like, it's a, it's a really, it's a storytelling show and there should be a degree of anonymity with the people that are talking to you. Not that necessarily the stories will need to be so anonymous, you know, like, but they could be. Uh, and so that's where, where it moved into a podcast. And I had seven stories, seven seven moments in my life as a young adult where it's like, I'm going to share these for the first season and kind of see where it goes. And these are things where it's like, I, the, the other side of all of this, while we were starting this, the show was, there was so much work focusing on the macro 
and sort of like these big institutional uh, challenges and changes to patriarchy and and sexism, you know, from your Weinstein's to your to your Bill Cosby's to et cetera. And I think the problem, and it goes into the show's title, is that there's a danger, and I think that that's important work. There's a danger for men and other people, but but men specifically, to see those Weinstein's and Cosby's and go, "That's not me." It's mm-hmm. other, other men, other men do that. I don't, yeah, but you ghosted somebody. Yes, yeah, but it's not related. It's not related. I don't have the kind of, I don't have Weinstein money. I don't like, I didn't rape anybody. And so it seemed like a bit of a disconnect there. So it was a little bit of like breaking the everyday actions and breaking the self mythology of the nice progressive guy, not trying to be an attack. But the only way to do that is if the host, if there's a level of self accountability. Um, and, you know, not doing it in a way that felt dour, but doing it in a way that's like, I fucked up and like I the reason I did it I'm going to try to make the best assessment I can is cuz because of this and um here's this here's here's the story of why. So that's my my sort of long long background to how it, how it came to be. Yeah, I mean, I think what you do really well on your show is first of all I think that you're you're willing to kind of go with the vulnerable places um in a way that it's not super familiar for from what I've seen before in other um, shows and content. Um, I also like you're pretty self-aware, like you do a lot of gut checks about like your own sort of reactions. And I think that's what we saw a little bit of in this episode was like you kind of like really digging into something that a lot of other people might have just done. Like you deleted the words I miss you right from Mm -hmm. from the end of an email and like most people would just be like, not even they would just do it and not even like think about it. They just would have deleted it, sent it and then not like analyzed it. So I think it's really interesting that you're you're kind of like digging into your own uh, sort of issues and then showing like at least in this episode, you sort of showed the other side of that, right, where somebody didn't do that thing that you just did. They actually put it out there on social media that this is a platonic friend, male friendship and I miss him. Um, and so I think that's a good segue for us to talk a little bit about like the decisions that you make as you thought through the, the show about the voice and tone that you were going to take. Cause there's definitely, obviously you said it before, right? It's a playful, um, tone mm-hmm. that you take. Um, but can you speak more to the voice and tone question? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I, I really, it means a lot to me that the show has something that's recognizable that people can hear. I think, I think for any show, that's a, that's a major goal. So I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit about that. And I, I have a few examples. Um, so I talked about like sort of the, the culture of media, the culture of media that I consumed and, and sort of, and I think for, for this show, and this is also a recommendation for anybody who's making, whether it's a podcast, whether you're, you know, you're making a TV show, whatever it is, like, what, what are you answering? What is the void that you're answering? Uh, and I think if you can answer that, it'll not only target your audience, but it'll, it'll help you each episode say, shit, we got to come back to that. That's what we're answering. So for me, there's like three or four kinds of shows. I'll, I'll limit it to podcasting because that's the medium that, that this show is in, uh, that I did not want to be. Uh, one of those was like the round table, uh, and I don't have any issues with chat casts or anything like that, but there's something about like the right round table, the academic chat of like, today we're going to be talking about ghosting and I'm going to talk <laughs> to you from my expertise without even giving one iota of reflection or something where it's like, <laughs> it just feels so superficial what I'm about to say to you and uh, did not want to do that. Um, and then also with like the sort of like the, the prescriptive men's media or the collector's men's media where it's like. Uh, you know, here are 10 kinds of razors you can do to do this or Mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, here are 20 movies that we're going to talk about. I'm a cinephile. I listen to movie podcasts, but you know, about men and coming of age. Yeah. Not one of those movies is about a non-binary person or a person of color or blah, blah. So like men's media, that sort of like, uh, is a, or what's the animal What's the arborist, uh, eats itself. The snake that eats itself. I'm forget. I forget what it's called right now or like the, the emblem. And the third is uh, sort of like the 
I'm going to I'm going to tell you who I am, but I'm going to like own the self mythology here. So I'm the fucking asshole. I'm the fucking asshole that cheated on my fucking girlfriend or the like the open mic guy that's like, here are my feelings. But what you don't know is because I control the narrative that I actually cheated on my girlfriend. But you don't need to know that you just need to know my feelings and like you're going to feel bad for me. (laughs) Wanted to stay away from all of those things. And the the ways to do that, I think, is like. The, the target for this show, and I think the playfulness comes a lot from like labeling. I think the universality is that gender is a monster and it is wonderful and terrible. And there is everybody creates a performance out of it. And I think if you, you have like the duality of like what was intended and what was behind that intention, you know, mm-hmm. so uh, whether it's like, you know, getting waxed whether it's uh, you know having a pickup line or something like that. And this is just across the board. And so I think for, for our show, each episode is, is meant to, to give some version of like, and this doesn't, we don't, this isn't necessarily the prescription for it, but like the, the performance or what was intended. And then really the episodes do not exist unless it's like a little bit of what was behind that and, and having some level. And again, this level of accountability. Um, so it's not a show that's meant to, it's inherent in the title, the title I hope people take in a very cheeky way where it's like, other guys, they're the mm-hmm. problem. But hey, girl, let me talk to you for a second. That guy over there, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like that should be, but the show should, what the show should be doing, the show is not successful unless the the host or the story is saying like, so here's what I did. I was that guy that went up to that woman and be like, that guy over there, you shouldn't be talking, you should talk to me. And the reason I did that is, you know, and and being as honest as I can is because like I just I hadn't gotten laid for or whatever it is like we're usually not mm-hmm. that crass, but um, I I just don't want to do I don't want to I don't want to hear I don't want to be a part of any media I don't I I I feel very 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 um, strongly that especially as as uh, a medium in particular which is like predominantly male voices and predominantly male experiences. If I'm going to be adding a show that's talking about male experiences that we target accountability, but then we also target what I think is missing a lot of it where it's like not sentimental, but it's like open tenderness, like very open tenderness and showcasing very quietly or maybe not so quietly, like the tenderness that I think should be culturally more, more accepted and also my own discomfort with it. And, um, I think there's an uh, there's there are opportunities to play within that. So those are those are a lot of like some of the ingredients or the thoughts that go into any episode that we do and we don't always succeed but I think we 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 hit those those spectrums of tone. Yeah. Um so I have I have a random question. Are you, were you ever an actor? I was uh so when I was starting high school, I thought I'd be an actor. Okay. Uh, so I did some plays and then I did okay. when I got into adulthood, when I became an adult, it's like, ah, comedy is going to be my thing. Uh, mm-hmm. So I didn't act uh, as an adult. Occasionally I'll do like a short film or, okay. you know, something for somebody. Okay. But I was a, I yeah. was loved comedy. I was a, uh, I did improv for, for years and uh, did some stand up not very successfully. Yeah. I mean, the only reason I'm asking is just cuz like you did those four sort of types really <laughs> perfectly. Like you I mean, cuz we're, you know, we're on a video call so I can see the way that you're doing it and like even the voice intonation and stuff as you kind of like cycled through those different male personas of, you know, like academic and then the the comedy guy and then whatever. It was hilarious. So, but let's let's now delve a little bit into your background like what what have you done? What sort of brought you to this point? Have you worked in audio before? Did you work in clearly you were gonna make this a video series? So did you work in TV before? Yeah, I, I left school, I left college, and um I started at Sesame Street actually. So I my goal was uh feature films. I wanted to be a writer and director. And then the other side of my life vocationally is I this is a bit apocryphal, but my mom, we asked my mom, she'll, t- she'll, she'll vouch for me. But apparently in the family, it's like, you're sort of, a lot of the men, it was like men of the cloth or men in camouflage. Mm-hmm. And so there was some early thoughts that considerations that I'd be a priest. Uh, wow. And I, I didn't take that road in any way, but there was something about uh, sort of like being a community leader 
that I really mm-hmm. liked. So I, I went into education and social work as well. And those worlds melded. So I like telling stories that this sounds really boring and dry what I'm about to say, but I'm like telling stories that have some degree of social responsibility. Um, and I think the medium moving into podcasting, there's so many steps that got here, but I think it makes sense to me because of the level of accessibility to create, to make as a creator mm-hmm. uh, as well. It's really important to me. Vo- voice and tone is very important as well as like your audience. You have such a connection with your audience in a way that when I was a filmmaker felt so distant, it felt so selective the ways that you are, even if somebody, you get your content on Vimeo or something like that, there's a different level of consumption. Um, and the communities around film are, are, they feel a bit cloistered in a different way than podcasting does, which feels, uh, it's almost like folk music. Like it's like the mm-hmm. way like folk communities during certain uh-huh. decades of, of, uh, in the United States. And I don't mean it's folky or that it's like, uh, their subcultures like podcasting is very, very, very significant as a medium, but yeah, I, I really, I found as well as, as a, as I think it's just an a, a expansive tool for storytelling. I think there's so much cinematically you can do in podcasting. Uh, I think as well, it sort of like has its arms in so many different mediums and I'm not saying that I made other men so it could be a TV show. I mean, quite reversely, but that like, you know, maybe one of these days we'll make another men's season. That's, that has to be accompanied by like a book, like a children's book or something. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. There's just yeah. so much to say, but I, and I love, I think when it comes down to it too, I really like, I, I, I love the interview format. I really like this being a hybrid where I can tell stories and make crazy voices and then actually include somebody's a very intimate interview that I had with them two hours on their porch. Um, mm-hmm. So, and that can, you know, I, I, I think those are a number of the reasons why it's, why it's the show that it is, but also why I, I got into podcasting. So do you have any sense of like your audience in terms of like men versus women uh, listeners? Bet. And every season it, it gets updated quite a bit in terms of who we hear. I was surprised when the, when the show first started that, uh, how many women got in touch. I, I I figured that the show would probably be predominantly men. I think we're probably pretty split at this point, mm-hmm. although it's probably still skews towards women. In terms of who we're hearing from, I'm hearing from, there is the sort of like, our, I think our target, our audience in terms of men, it's like, uh, I mean, this is self-labeled beta man, or sort of like the beta males that feel... Mm-hmm. Um, maybe feel a little bit of curiosity as well about the world of masculinity around them and how to engage with it. And then there's, I, um, I don't know if this is fair to say this is from, we've done audience surveys. We've talked to audience members. We've done a number of things to try to figure it out. I think again, and this is intentional in a world in a, in a, a landscape in which there's so many men's voices it's, I think there is maybe safety isn't the right word, but I'm going to use safety. There's, there's something nice about sort of like, we are going to own male voices are going to own what they're doing. And also Mm -hmm. we are going to present, this is a safe place. There's not like anger and stuff like that. We're, we're not going to shy away from it. We're going to make, hold Mm -hmm. people accountable, but it's like, it is a space for tenderness in a way that's not asking anybody else except men to to hold that space for each other. And we, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think there's something from, from what I've heard from women that, that there's something both freeing as well as like, cool, I don't have to do the fucking work here. Like you, you guys, <laughs> like I'm going to tune in. This is great to hear. I'm excited. Keep it going. <laughs> and, um, cause that's the other thing too, Adele, is that especially going into this season of, of friendship, the other thing that the show was doing is like, all these great people would send me for years. They send me articles like um, the, the the way to men's friendship is this and the way the blah, blah, blah. Why? And I was mm-hmm. like, these articles are great. And they're all written by women. And women. Yeah. I'm saying that in a way where I'm not like women can't tell male experiences. Not at all. It's like, where are the fucking men talking about <laughs> like 
their the void and in intimacy yeah. or their needs or whatever. Like why why as well? Even in media, are are we having to? And, and when I'm seeing men write about it, it feels so, so superficial. Or it's like. I think even even male writers have a hard time to like, I really want to tell the story of like why my best friend's wedding was heartbreaking for me because I felt like I lost a good friend. And instead I have to mm-hmm. I have to create this angle where it's about weightlifting or, or something like that. Right. Um yeah. So yeah, I, I think I, I that's that's another part of it too. And and again, going into this this thematic season looking at friendship, that was a real reaction on my part. Yeah. I was, I mean, I want to dig into that a lot more just because our theme is clearly friendship. We chose only one of the episodes within this season, but your whole season was focused on friendship. So you have something like, I don't know, 10 episodes? Yeah, nine nine episodes this this third season about it. Yeah. So like, what was the, what was the impetus for, for choosing that as the theme this, this season? Well, three things. We started working on season two in uh, spring or summer 2018, so nearly three years ago. And I was fascinated by touch, touch in spaces, physical spaces between men, which is interesting, mm-hmm. a very interesting conversation to be having now. now I'm even, yes. yeah, because I've been uh, like the void of that, that, that exists. Yeah. But I was having these kind of early introductory in- interviews with, with a lot of men, and this thing kept coming up in interviews especially when you talk about touch and you talk about spaces where men, not all men, but a number of these interviews very early on saying, I don't have any friends. And what are you talking about? You know how yeah, I'm 35, but yeah, but we just talked about like, you just, you told me about, you went to happy hour and there were 12 and you guys, and it's like, yeah, but I, I can't talk to those guys about being secretly bisexual. It's like, why, why not? And then as well, because of the show that is like, I was also having that issue. I was also mm-hmm. having that issue and I have all these these numbers in my phone. I had one day where I just would like, I had a really sh- like a really tough sort of mental health day and I was just scrolling through my phone, didn't call one person, hundreds of names in this phone, tons of, tons of mm-hmm. men in particular that would call themselves friends. So there was that, men talking about not having friends. The other side was that the only voices that I heard talking about this were women. And not just the articles that I mentioned that kept coming my way or media, but also so many partners kept coming to me and going like, hey, you do this show, but also like, I'm I'm an approachable person. They'd be like, dude, Jordan, like, I go out, like I go out and I'm like, you should go out. Like, you should go hang, go to the movies or go hang out with, and he's always like, I'm cool. But I'm like, how can you be cool? Like, you need, please, for my sake, go and talk to a friend. Yeah. And... uh <laughs> And so everything sort of funneled to why don't we just why don't we do a season about this? I don't know what it's going to be about. Let's try yeah. not to label it too heavily. And we got into making it our our focus specifically came to like adult best friendships, you know. And the the two the two filters for me were where is it not happening? But more importantly, more importantly, I think for this show and I think for the success of this show is like, where are those microcosmic areas in which these articles are missing? And especially my own experience as a man, where I know when my friend sends me a text that doesn't have the man, the word man or bro in it and saying something as a term of endearment, I love you. I've been thinking about you. I miss you, whatever it is, like mm-hmm. how that sits in my heart. Where are those stories being told? And where is that? And the mm-hmm. like, Men are in terrible shape. Like, what mm-hmm. can we point to to say, like, this is where men are doing the work. This is where a lot of men are doing the work. And this is as well where we need to celebrate it. And we also need to sort of endeavor to make this more happen more. And I think the filter of, like, the best way to do that in some ways is, like, let's talk about your friendship with Joe. You know, let's talk mm-hmm. about the this specific yeah. moment. I, I pretty much, I, I think I'm right. I'm sort of such a blur doing this season, but that's, like, pretty much was the was the angle. Yeah. Um I want to play a clip that I I grabbed from your show from the episode we listened to uh-huh. and I I just want to talk about it because it really struck me um as really as I said earlier self-reflective and self-aware um but also like god so heavy in some ways. So here let's listen. Erasing the words I miss you in my email to Sam 
really troubled me. Not because I couldn't say it. It troubled me because not being able to say I miss you, well, I felt like it was tied to that early fear of being called gay. And the fucked up thing is that it wasn't fear of Sam thinking I was gay or calling me gay or someone else reading it and saying, you're soft. These fucking adolescent restrictions have carried over into adulthood and made it so that I don't expect an affectionate reply. It's not someone screaming a slur at me that I'm afraid of. It's the absence of returned vulnerability. And it's driving me crazy. Yeah, so, I mean, I think you hit on two really important points there. It's just like this legacy of, of like, adolescence that just sort of, it's like scarred you. I'm just going to talk about it for for you like as an sure. individual, just because I don't want to um, paint with a broad brush. But um, so that, but also like that idea of the return of affection of, you know, put, I mean, this is, this is, you know, not unique to men, right? Like this is why women won't hit on men that they like find attractive, right? Because you don't want to be vulnerable and then get rejected. So, um, but the two things together just struck me as so, so interesting. So I don't know, do you have like, was this sort of a revelation that you came to as you were doing the story? Or is it something that you kind of always had this, this sort of gut feeling about? Well, it's, I, I don't know who I have to thank for introspection. Um, you know, I do have to, I do want to like salute my mother and the number of, um, mostly women that raised me. And I do think that they had a, had a big part do it, especially a man. I think they sort of, uh, worked to like, <laughs> like, let's put the work in so that this guy, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying I'm perfect mm-hmm. at all by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I still, I, I, it shows up in this episode. I'm still a product of cultural homophobia uh, mm-hmm. from childhood. And I think the reflection has shown up in ways so that like the I, episodes get built around and I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question a little bit, but I'm going to, sure. I'm going to go a little bit of a loop here episodes and i think the quiet mission of this show is removing shame i think men are socialized to have terrible reactions to shame and also there's there are just these these giant ways in which shame shows up in our gut and often you know the sad the sad and hard side of it is it's often like a, a violent or vindictive reaction so i mean so many so many of us myself included as a man are scared of men because of what their reaction may be to blank You made that dude feel gay. He's going to knock you out. Um, Mm -hmm. You turn that guy down. He's going to assault you. He's going to call you a blank, you know, whatever it is. So I as well in my socialized body uh, as a straight young guy found over the course of my adulthood, these times where it's like, that doesn't sit right for me. Like I'm feeling against, there was a, we were going to put into this episode a picture a picture that a friend of mine, a Polaroid from 2002 or 2003, where where my best friend has his arm around me and my hand is not touching his, but my hand looks like it's touching his. We're at a party. Mm-hmm. It's just like, this is my boy, yeah. like that kind of picture. Uh-huh. And my hand looks like it's touching his. And he would never let me show that picture to anybody. He's like, you have to throw it yeah. away or get rid of it. And I still have the picture. Um, and I remember like both very very easily accepting that and going like yeah. dude you're right we can't show this picture to anybody and yeah. then as well like that deep profound sadness of yeah. both why can't i do that and also how who cares, who cares? Yeah. and like that also you wouldn't want to share that like the public love between us like right. i you're my brother you are like i mm-hmm. i i would die you know i i've got your back like all the the, the idioms of friendship like mm-hmm. i got your back blah, blah blah so uh you know i think there's there's a few things with with that that coda there or that portion of um that you played um and it really did come up with with darnell talking in this episode and uh you know, myself and, and this, you know, this age, uh, 
you know, be my late thirties, early forties around the time that all of this happened, um, with erasing that with Sam, like I'm, I'm smart enough to know or smart enough to be reflective and see these patterns now to be like, that doesn't feel good in my gut that I can't, I, this has to stop. And, um, as well, recognizing like the, 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 just the general fear and the universality of fear of, of vulnerability, um, with other people. And you're right. It's, it's not specific to men. And I think, especially with this episode, <laughs> this episode a lot, I thought a lot about, uh, Brene Brown's power of vulnerability talk, which echoes in my mm-hmm. brain. I think it's really, it's a really significant piece of media. Um, but there's something she says in it about, uh, she does talk about shame, but she talks about, you know, I, I, she says, like, I posted on Twitter, tried to find out what for people is like really vulnerable. And, you know, she gave some examples and it just makes me cry that like the weight that we carry and the things that we prevent ourselves from doing and also just the silencing. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, it's really, it just feels really dangerous to put yourself in that space in which there's silence. And I think like the bravest, just the bravest people are, uh, are able to at least acknowledge it. And, uh, I think acknowledging it and doing it anyway is the thing. Like, I, I don't necessarily believe in the full bravery of like, I'll do it. I don't care. I vulnerability mm-hmm. is, is really, it's a monster and we all struggle with it. So I don't know if, how much I, I answered there, but um, it was also really important to me this episode. I think it's a shared experience for everybody this episode. Not everybody has social media. Not everybody is a mm-hmm. uh, is a male that's or male identified that listens to this episode. But I think everybody struggles with being naked, you know, being yeah. being exposed and. Um, I I think that this episode would have been would have been okay if we didn't mention the cultural homophobia. But I just wanted to. The other thing too that's important for me for this show is to paint sort of like the 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 bigger the bigger connection points to where this stuff starts mm-hmm. for all of us, and then hopefully yeah. for other men to to acknowledge like, yeah, I used to hold hands with my best friend. I used to do this, I used to that. But there was there was that time, and that still as a forty year old man. Mm-hmm. That's tied to being be that fear. That's so sad mm-hmm. that I'm carrying that 30 years later. Uh, you know, either that fear or yeah. retribution or silence that Sam or somebody would also carry that fear that they wouldn't even respond back to me. Yeah. I mean, I think how old were you when you said that picture was taken with your friend? Um, we were in our early 20s, uh, post college. So yeah. probably 22, yeah. 23, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's amazing how long these sort of like tiny little things that happen in our lives sort of leave this indelible mark, even though it was just sort of like this little tiny blip um, of something that happened. And like, had he not said anything and you had just gone about your day and like had shared it and whatever, like it wouldn't have had the an equally opposite impact on you. You know what I mean? Like it wouldn't have probably really even registered that, you know, oh, this is you know, vulnerable of me to do this. Like it probably just would have gone right over your head. But unfortunately this like one comment that this friend made has left like this indelible mark and then probably impacted relationships after that, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and sort of your, your willingness to be vulnerable after that. So, um, yeah, I agree. (laughs) I agree. Yeah. (laughs) So before we wrap up, I always like to ask our guests if they can share a podcast pick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I want to take this mantle or this time just to mention three and two of them are independent. I'll uh, mention just quickly go through them and reasons why. But I I don't think these are uh, one of these has has gotten a few um, a little bit more notice this year. Uh, So the first one is a bigger platform. BBC has a show called Soul Music that they do kind of quarterly. Um, they'll do like four episodes. I don't know their production schedule, why that is. But it's a show that's, I am not the audience member for whatever the pitch is for this show. Because it's like, it's a show that goes sort of like tells the story of famous songs. And mm-hmm. I like music. Uh <laughs> 
I am just not a music podcast person. And okay. this show guts me. I am, mm-hmm. I'd say it's a documentary format. It is non-narrated and you can do whatever sampling of their catalog. I think you'll be, you know, if it's, if you're the audience, you're the audience. It is. And they have this thing where it's like the 11 minute mark is, is like 11 minutes and 30 seconds is always when I tear up. It's like they get, they like <laughs> nail that part of the story, but they tell the stories of like sitting on the dock of the bay to the star spangled okay. banner to whatever. And it's like, it is so beautifully woven and they're first person narratives. Uh, okay. So it's like uh, my, my daughter and I were biking one day. That's where the episode will start. And it's not the musician. It's not the writer of the song. It's just this person. And like, We listened to this song because my husband died and this is what, you know, he remembered in the hospital uh, when he had brain cancer, you know, like it's, and and then they'll they'll weave in uh, musicologists. So that one I have to recommend. I never really talked to people, listen to it. And the other two very quickly, uh, the disaster area, uh, I I can't remember her name who does it. She's, she's in Pennsylvania and I, I want to recognize it because it's just like, it is, she just sits down and talks for an hour and a half, two hours. But the amount of research, she just goes through disasters. And so they're also that her patrons will give like 25 bucks or something like that. And she will do a deep dive on that disaster. So plane crashes to, you know, fires and blah, blah. And there's something it's it's so comforting hearing sort of like a sober <laughs> voice. Just give like the diagnostics of what went wrong with blank. And she's also okay. super quirky, and uh, I really enjoy listening to her. And the other show is The Secret Adventures of Black People, uh, which is Nicole Hill, who uh, is also a, a friend of mine. I, I I think about her very dearly, and I'm also so excited about this show and what she's put together. And uh, I would call myself out if I'm like, I know her, I have to give her a plug. I think it's just great, great, great personal storytelling, bite-sized episodes, 10 to 12 minutes. It's funny. It's in her voice. It's, uh, it's also super, it's super every day, uh, in terms of the kinds of stories she's telling. And I think it's great. So those are the ones that I would recommend. Nice. I will definitely link, link out to all of those in the show notes, just so people can find them. So how can people follow you? Where can people, you know, do all, all the, the things, things that they do? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, obviously with a podcast, you should subscribe, listen to the podcast. We want to hear from people too. Um, so social media is pretty easy to find. You can find me uh, variations of Mark Pagan or the Mark Pagan on Twitter and other men is on Twitter and uh, Instagram as well. We're getting ready for our th- fourth and fifth seasons. We're going to be doing them consecutively, I think. And we're actually looking for, we, we're right now, we're looking for stories. And so I, I will have a pitch that will be up on, uh, or sort of like some details on social media. But honestly, if you just want to get in touch, if you want to get in touch a period, that's great. I would, we'd love to hear from, from audience members, but if you have an idea or a story that you want to you, you know, uh, you've listened to the show, you know, kind of the stories that we do, please, please, please. I encourage you to send us an email. Uh, and that's other men need help at gmail.com. And we will, we usually do our best at getting back in touch with people, but yeah, please get in touch. Okay. I will put the links to all of that stuff in the show notes too. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really a pleasure to talk to you, Mark. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And I hope you and the audience uh, enjoyed this deep dive. Thank you for listening and being a part of the Podcast Brunch Club community. Do you have any thoughts on our discussion this month? Send a message or voice memo to podcast at podcastbrunchclub.com. PBC is a passion project and we rely on support from our global community to continue bringing people together in person and online. So if you feel like PBC has contributed to your life in any way, please consider becoming a patron or making a one-time donation. Go to podcastbrunchclub.com slash support for more information. If you're interested in becoming an organizational partner, go to podcastbrunchclub.com slash sponsors. A quick thanks to our early partners. 
Podbean. For one free month of podcast hosting, go to podbean.com slash PBC. Podchaser, the IMDb of podcasts. Listen Notes, a podcast search engine. Critical Frequency, the podcast network for everyone else. The Venn Media, a weekly newsletter for curious minds. And Lentigua Williams and Company, podcast network, telling stories in the seams of society. Finally, some credits for this episode. Katie DeFiori is our audio editor. Music is from Chad Crouch and Miss Ayal Ghana, downloaded from Free Music Archive. I'm Adela, founder of Podcast Brunch Club. And as always, thanks and happy listening. <laughs>